In Jesus' holy name, I present this video to you, a few words on deliverance. Many people seem to these days go about and say, you know, I prayed and uh, I'm under spiritual attack. I'm doing the right things. I'm under spiritual attack, spiritual warfare, this and that. But nobody talks too much about deliverance. Maybe they need deliverance. Maybe people around them need deliverance. Maybe the people they're interacting with need deliverance. And it's something we need to do as the body of Christ. And if we're not doing it, then we're doing a disservice. In Mark chapter 9, when people came to Jesus, there was a man who had a child with a dumb spirit in him. So in Mark chapter 9, it says, and one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of, of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried, and rent him sore, and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hands, and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. So here we see a clear example of Jesus and his disciples. First he called them faithless. He said, O oh, faithless generation. Right in verse 19, he answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. How long shall I suffer you? Why? Why does, he, why does he have to suffer them? Because they're supposed to be doing it. And why did he call them faithless? Because they couldn't get the job done. So now, when at the end, they privately ask him, why could we not cast him out? In verse 28, why could we not cast him out? Why couldn't we do it? Because it's our job to do it. We're supposed to be doing it. We're not supposed to sit there and say, oh, well, you know, I guess that's not for me. I dust my feet and move on. I guess I'll preach somewhere else. You're supposed to be delivering people. It's our job. Another clear indication of this is in Matthew chapter 7. We need to get on our jobs. All of us. I'm motivated right now to do the same. I'm surrounded by it. I keep counseling people, which is something I'm going to get into. There is counseling. Counseling is part of it. But you still have to deliver the demon. Counsel the person, deliver the demon. Matthew chapter 7, it says, in verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. Why is there going to be many people claiming this if we're not supposed to be doing it? Now these people are on the wrong end of it, and they're not born again, and they're doing it for themselves. That's why Jesus says, next, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. If you're born again, you're his sheep. Jesus knows you. Like the men in 1 Corinthians 3, where 
Paul rebukes them. And it says, I cannot speak unto you as spiritual, your infant in Christ. Christ knows his sheep. So these people here that he's clearly rebuking are not the same. That's another side topic, though. Another thing. In Matthew 12, we see a warning against a whole generation, but some notes on deliverance. It says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then he goeth, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first, even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. So when you cast out a demon, guess what's going to happen? Maybe not every time, but it, this is clearly saying that this happens. So we have to prepare for this. This is a war. That's why it's called spiritual warfare. So it's saying that seven more come back that are more wicked than the first. Sounds stronger. Sounds worse. Right? So now what we have to do is prepare for that. So it, we don't want it back in. So how do we do that? What do, how do we prepare for this? What does the gospel say towards this? This is where the counseling of the people comes in. You can't just deliver somebody and then expect the demon not to come back. 2 Corinthians 10 gives us the answer. What we're supposed to do. What our job is as believers. It says, starting at verse 3 of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, or fleshly in, in, in other words. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. It can't have a stronghold if you know better. And you don't fall in agreement with it. Allowing a stronghold to be within you. Within your mind. Giving it access. Giving it free reign to do what it wants against you. But you have to be in disagreement with what it is. Whatever it's telling you. You're not beat. It hasn't won. The storm didn't win. Satan never won. None of that is true. These are lies of the demon to create a stronghold in your mind so that you can't ever be free from it. You're giving it the freedom. You ever hear the, the expression, don't let people rent space in your head? Don't let demons rent space in your head. Okay? Then we have James 4, 7 to counteract what was happening to the wicked generation. This was So let's go back to Matthew 12 for a second. He was giving a warning to the wicked generation, but we're not the wicked. God forbid. Matthew 12 gives us an indication of what's going to happen to them. But James chapter 4, you probably know the verse I'm going to go to counteracts that. Let's go back to Matthew 12, though, for a quick look. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. Look at that. My house. Stronghold. My house. That's a stronghold. It's not his house. Stop giving it permission to live in you and live in others around you. If you say you love them, deliver them. Deliver yourself. It's not, it's not their house unless you let it be. That's your house. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Yeah, well, who, who who emptied it, swept it, and garnished it? I don't have the power of deliverance. The Holy Spirit does. God does. Then he go, then goeth he, and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, in that stronghold. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. But you know what? We're not wicked. We're set apart and set aside from this wickedness. If we choose to do our jobs. Now let's go to James chapter 4, 
and you'll see how it lines up with 2 Corinthians chapter 10 perfectly. It says to pull down all strongholds, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, taking every thought into, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So now James chapter 4 is going to make a lot more sense in light of that. That cross-referencing is very strong. So James chapter 4, we're going to read 1 through 7. We're going to read 7 first, and then in light of 2 Corinthians 10, we're going to read 1 through 7. So 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit yourselves to God with every thought. So there's no strongholds. Now, starting it from the top, for context's sake here. From whence come wars and fighting among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and ye war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. So they're desiring what? What are they, what are they killing for? What are they lusting for and have not? We have desires of the flesh that can be satisfied in a godly way. You need your you need your you know, below the belt satisfied marriage. You're hungry, go get a job. You have a need to steal, work for it. You have need for things, but you ask not, so you receive not. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war. You have not because you ask not. You need to ask God. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. 1 John 5.14 says, Ask according to his will. Verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Like 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Be not unequally yoked. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Well, how can you, like in verse 7 says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You want that to happen, but you're friends with the world. And you're an enemy of God at the time. And you wonder why the devil won't leave you alone. You made friends with him. Do you think this, that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. In, in contrast, in Mark chapter 9, the father, when he was told that if he believes he can do anything, he said, Lord, he said in tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. That's humility. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. So when them seven wicked spirits come back after the first has been delivered, if you teach them to resist in humility after fixing their mind up and fixing their actions up, then they will be delivered and stay delivered. They could have 700 demons coming. It ain't going to matter. Luke 10, 19 says, I've given you authority to trample over snakes and scorpions and over all power of the enemy. Stand up. Stand against, like Ephesians 6 says, stand firm. You can't stand against unless you're standing. And you need your sword to do it. Here's the, some verses to help you. God bless y'all.